This company designs, develops, and builds dynamically stabilized, stabilized robots to address global needs while commercializing products for the construction sector. Hey guys, and welcome to our episode of We Learn Nation. For today's interview, we have Mark Pivac, co-founder and CTO at FBR, the company building the world's first autonomous bricklaying robot. So welcome, Mark. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for joining We Learn Nation today. Thank you, Elsa. I was building big robots and I didn't start out that way, but the story actually starts a long, long time ago for me. My father's a mining surveyor. And when I was a child, he used to bring home surveying instruments. And one day he brought home one that was in pieces and I was about 10 and I put it back together. And that sort of sparked an interest in optical metrology when I was quite young. Then fast forward, really fell in love with windsurfing when I was a teenager and decided that I wanted to build really accurate fins. So I learned how to build uh, CNC machines, which was back in the nineties, which wasn't so common back then. And anyway, fast forward a few more years, that had turned into a small business where I was building custom CNC machines for various industries around Perth. And I had the idea of uniting optical measurement technology and CNC machines to build really big robots. Uh, and at the time there wasn't really a market for what I'd invented. So I just kind of sat around in the back of my mind, not going anywhere. And then in 2005, there was a building boom in Western Australia and a big shortage of bricklayers. And that's where that finally clicked that this technology could be applied to that particular problem. So the real story is there was some technology there that was waiting that didn't really have a viable commercial use for a long time. And then the right problem came along and I fortunately had the right solution to it. And that's how FBR started. Wow. Really interesting. Sorry. Really interesting background. Okay. So also I know that you're an engineer by heart and that you're working with your brother. So how is that like? Yeah, look, it's really good. Mike, he's actually my cousin. He looks after the commercial side of things and the corporate side of things. He's actually a machinist by trade, but he worked in the aviation industry, managing fleets of aircraft for a long time. And actually when he was a child, he used to work for his uncle as a brickies laborer. So Mike's been on the hard work end of laying bricks. So it's an industry that we're both sort of pretty familiar with, uh, but we've both got an aviation background. I'm an aerospace engineer by training and I spent time in the Royal Australian Air Force. What we've done really is we've brought that high technology and systems engineering and fleet management from the aviation industry into the construction industry. And really we're sort of leading the introduction of large scale robotic technology into the construction industry. Because bricks have been laid for about 6,000 years as far as we can tell. And the industry hasn't changed very much. Almost every other industry has automated and mechanized but when you go out to a building site, you still see masons mixing concrete or cement by hand, moving bricks around by hand and doing everything by hand. But you compare that to going to a factory, which is manufacturing almost anything these days, be it cars or furniture. And all you see is rows and rows of machines and robots doing everything and people really just tending that and keeping it all running. And we see that that's how the construction industry has to move because there just aren't the people available to do what we want to do to lift our standards of living. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Basically you discovered the necessity and then you turn it into a product. I have two questions regarding this point. What will you say is the future of the robotics industry and how do you find the product market fit? Yeah. So we think we have a pretty good product market fit. It's been a long development time because the construction industry can't tolerate a solution that's almost right. The solution has to be perfect. So it's been a long road. Like I said before, this started in 2005. So we've been going nearly 18 years now to perfect the product and how it can work in the industry. One of the big issues is that builders by and large don't really know much about robots. They don't need to. Sure. So we have to introduce robotics and high technology into an industry that's not used to it and mm -hmm. hasn't had to deal with robots or much automation at all. 
Uh, so what we've come up with is a concept called wall as a service. So really these robots are going to work and they do work here in Western Australia, not too different to the way a mason works. So the builder gets in touch with his mason and gives him an address and the plans and a contract to go and lay the bricks in a wall. And that's exactly how it works for builders working with us and wall as a service. The only difference is that what turns up on site is not a team of masons and a cement mixer, but a Hadrian X construction robot, its operators and a telehandler. And once the bricks are delivered and we've aligned ourselves to the building site and construction starts, we've achieved that dream of being able to build a house in a couple of days or depending on the design, even a day. That really speeds up the construction process. And of course, there's a lot of other things which can happen in parallel now. Because we're building robotically, it's very accurate. So the overall dimensional accuracy of the house is such that it's possible to do a lot of other processes in parallel, like build the roof trusses or even the interior fit out all in parallel. The builders haven't quite got used to that process yet. They still like to do it the traditional way. For example, we built our first demonstration house, which we built here. We wanted to have a pre-made roof to go onto it. And the truss manufacturers said, no, no, we won't build the trusses until you build the house. We'll come out and measure it up and make sure it's all okay. Uh, and then we'll build the trusses. And they came out and measured it up and it was all perfect. So now they're happy to build trusses in parallel. So. What it means is that the day that the brick laying is finished, the next day the roof can go on. These kind of possibilities are really streamlined the construction industry. And it goes beyond the robotics because it enables so many other things to happen in parallel. Wow, really interesting. Thank you so much for sharing. I'm pretty sure that that was a challenge and it still is a challenge. I think people have to get used to it and also the industry and also the companies as well, because at the end of the day, it's a service that you're providing. And talking about the technology, I wanted to ask you, I know that you guys use kind of like a different technology that it's called a dynamic stabilization technology. So I'm curious to ask how does it work? Yeah. So what we want to achieve is really quick setup on site. So our Hadrian X robots drive to site in a similar way that a mobile crane or a concrete pump drives to site, puts down the outriggers and unfolds the boom. The problem we have is that crane Although it might be delivering a, an object quite precisely, you know, there's always a human at the end of the rope guiding that object into its final location. Or a concrete pump, there's somebody on the end of the hut is guiding where the concrete's going to go. And let's face it, if the concrete's within a few inches of where it needs to be, or even a few feet, that's usually okay. But when you place a brick, it has to be perfectly positioned within millimetres or a sixteenth of an inch of where it needs to be. Now, when you have a really long boom and our boom can reach out a hundred feet or 30 odd meters, so we can build the whole house from one setup position, that boom has flex and deflection in it. So where you program the end of the boom to go, if you didn't have dynamic stabilization, the end of the boom wouldn't actually be where you think it is. So we use some advanced position tracking technology and what we do is we actually measure the end of the boom very precisely and very fast. And that happens over and over again, every second. And then there's a very high speed, highly dynamic robot on the end of our boom, which compensates that motion. So the brick actually ends up in the perfect location, even though it's a hundred feet away from the Hadrian X. Now that we're talking about bricks is Adrian X is specialized to work with some specific type of bricks or it can work with anything? In theory, it can work with anything, mm -hmm. but because it's a robot, it doesn't care how heavy the bricks are. And it's definitely faster and more productive to use bigger bricks. So we can actually lift bricks, which are much heavier than what a human would like to handle. So that's the optimum brick. So the optimum brick for Adrian is much bigger than a normal brick. So a normal brick, it's designed around the size of a human hand so that a bricklayer can, you know, lay these bricks single-handed all day long. 
uh, whereas Hadrian can handle a brick, which is on our new model, up to 45 kilos or about 90 pounds, which for a human would be maybe It'll some be, really strong yeah. guys could <laughs> lift it, but not repetitively and not all day and certainly not 700 times an hour like Hadrian is able to do. Definitely, Hadrian is a wonder. Thank you for sharing that information as well. Okay, so Thank I you. know that, Mark, you have been around for a couple of years now, if we can put it like that. So I would like to ask about the challenges that you have overcome in the company, especially talking on the business side and also specifically on the hardware part. Did you have any issues with supply chain or procurement or stuff like that? I've been working on this project and business for about 18 years. Uh, and of course, during that time period, you see all the ups and downs of the economic cycle. Probably our first big hurdle was the GFC or the global financial crisis back in 2008. You probably weren't in business back then. I remember walking into the boardroom. We didn't have our own boardroom back then. We were sort of a group of different companies working together on this project. And I remember we were about to raise some more money because we just sort of run out and we put a prospectus together for the document for the fundraising that had just come hot off the press and we were having a meeting ready to hand that out to investors. And I remember the chairman, who was also a chairman of a fairly large building company, saying, oh, well, you can forget about that much. And uh, he was right. Uh, we did try to raise money, but we didn't. And that was sort of the start of a period of, well, I had to restart up my engineering business and keep the project alive. And then in 2015, we managed to, so that was a period of about seven years where the project was reasonably quiet, still alive, but not progressing at the level that we would have liked. And we were able to attract the right finance. And since then we've been pretty well funded. We're now listed on the Australian Stock Exchange and that has its own challenges. It does provide good access to capital, but for a development company, there's continuous disclosure obligations. So you have to keep the market informed of what's going on. And there's always a balance which has to be struck between keeping the market informed and yet preserving your intellectual property. So there's always a pressure for the market to know what you're developing. Whereas if you're a private company, you'd probably stay in stealth mode for quite a bit longer until you pop out of the cake. There's always that challenge of balancing those two. Uh, and of course, we have a lot of investors who are very interested and very enthusiastic about our technology and really looking forward to us getting that to market. And we've been out in the market in a very small way with our, our first model of Hadrian X. And our next development of that, it's really just a quite a lot of small improvements, which when you add them all up, make a, a significant change to the commercial viability of Hadrian. And that's what we're working on now. And that's sort of ready to hit the market any day now. I did see the investors part on the website and I think it's impressive what you have built over the years. So congratulations on that. So talking on the hardware side, any procurement supply chain issues, especially after and during the pandemic, did you have any of those? Yeah. So the pandemic was a huge impact for us and like a lot of industries and businesses, we really didn't know what was going to happen. Unfortunately, we had to do quite a bit of restructuring in our company and we had to downsize quite heavily when the pandemic first hit. With the benefit of hindsight, on the one hand, we made the right decisions because we didn't know what would happen with the economy. But on the other hand, we probably should have been scaling up at that time. But nobody really knew because the stimulus in the construction industry in Australia was extremely effective. And that basically triggered a massive building boom and boom in the economy. Uh, and of course, we just downsized thinking that we'd have to make our way through some really difficult economic times. And then boom times in the construction industry is when builders find it difficult to actually survive. Sounds counterintuitive, but costs are rising, labor's in short supply, there's shortages of materials, uh, and projects tend to take longer, which impacts builders' cash flow. So now here in Australia, there are some issues with some builders under financial pressure and 
Some building companies, unfortunately, have gone out of business. Others have done really well. And fortunately, we're working with some great construction companies over here who weathered those ups and downs and are coming out the other side really well. Some of the projects that we're working on, our parts have gone really well, but the other parts of the construction industry, there's a continual wait for trades and materials and all that sort of thing. So some of those projects have taken quite a bit longer than anybody anticipated. So there's some of the challenges. On the side of building Hadrian's, we kind of foresaw that there would be disruption in the supply chain. And fortunately, we know pretty well what our long lead time items are. So we were able to secure what we needed. Sometimes you need to get pretty creative. There's certain okay. computer chips and so on, which are used in our control system where we had to basically scour the edges of the earth to get what we needed in time. And I really feel for companies that need tens of thousands or millions of those chips we needed yeah. in the tens, perhaps. And it was hard work just to get those. Fortunately, we've got a good supply chain. We've got a global supply chain. We work with the best companies around the world on probably almost every continent. We purchase a lot of stuff from China, Korea, Taiwan, Europe, the USA, Israel the Middle East, we buy components and materials from all over the world. And eventually Hadrian will hopefully impact all of the world and help to lift the standard of housing across the board. We really look for the best technologies in any field. It doesn't have to be construction specific. We use a lot of technology out of the defense and aerospace industry, and we're applying that to good civilian purposes with the intent of bringing construction robotics to the construction industry. It's You're been a real challenge, but it's been good. I'm glad to hear that everything worked out at the end. So thank yeah. you for sharing that as well and for being super honest about it. And one of the last questions, Mark, I would like to ask you, what are the next steps for FBR? Are you guys planning on expanding or releasing any other projects soon? Really good question, Elsa. And I've got a really great answer for it. Uh, we just recently done a capital raise backed by M&G, who's one of the big funds out of London, to take our first three Hadrian X's across to the US. So we're in the process of planning all that out and building those three Hadrians, which will be especially for the US market. It's fairly likely that we'll take one of the Australian ones over there first, because there is a lead time on getting US trucks and all that sort of thing, getting it all certified to go in there. But that's really exciting for us because we see the North American market, Mexico, the US, mm. Canada as being one of those fantastically big markets, which really needs this kind of technology. So we'll be really pleased to bring it over there. Amazing. And last but not least, Mark, do you have any advice for future entrepreneurs starting on this path? Yeah, look, I could give so much advice. There's been so many learnings over the years. I guess what you've really got to do is Hadrian X came about because there was a nexus of technology, a need, the customers out there needed this, and there was technology that was able to solve that problem. So when you can bring things together from different industries to solve a real problem, be it a consumer problem or a business problem or a society problem, that's when there's a real business there. The human side of things and the financial side of things for us has been more difficult than the technology side of things. The technology hasn't been easy, but I'll also say that building a team and getting the finance that you need to do this kind of project is not easy either. It's one of those things where to hit a home run, you've got to keep walking up to the plate, right? So there'll be plenty of knockbacks, but if it's something the world needs and you believe in it and you're passionate about it, there's a way. You can always find a way. Thank you so much for sharing that great piece of advice, Mark, and for being here with us today. Do you have any social media handles? Where can people find you or the company? Yeah, so a real simple website, fbr.com.au. And then there's all the links to our socials from that. But search fbr.com.au or Fast Brick Robotics and you should find us. And remember, guys, that you can also find more information, interesting articles, interesting interviews are on our website, thunderhub.com slash miller-nation. We would love to hear from you. And once again, Mark, thank you so much for taking the time. We really appreciate having you today at Miller Nation. Thank you, Elsa.